Hello, and welcome to A Health Policy. The policies and the documents were really narrow to COVID. They didn't take into account the integral aspects of, of health. I'm your host, Alan Weil. Migrants on their way to another country and people seeking asylum are often overlooked in health policy. During the COVID-19 pandemic, as immigration and asylum processes stalled, thousands of people were stranded at Mexico's northern border. With limited health care and sometimes crowded and unsanitary living conditions, COVID posed a significant risk. How Mexico's response to COVID-19 took into account the particular needs of in-transit migrants and asylum seekers is the topic of today's health policy. I'm speaking with Yetza Bajorquez, an epidemiologist in the Department of Population Studies at El Colegio de la Frontera Norte, and Cesar Infante, a surgeon and researcher at the National Institute of Public Health. Doctors Bajorquez and Infante and their co-authors published a paper in the July 2021 issue of Health Affairs. In that paper, they examined COVID-19 health policy documents issued by Mexican federal, state, and municipal authorities. Exploring those documents, which uh, were prepared between January and September of 2020, they found only seven out of 80 publicly available documents explicitly mentioned the healthcare needs of in-transit migrants and asylum seekers. We'll talk in more detail about what they found in today's program. Dr. Bajorquez, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. And Dr. Infante, welcome to the program. Thank you. Hello. Many, many thanks for the invitation. Let's uh, start by setting the stage a bit. Uh, this is a group that maybe not everyone has thought about. You focus on the health needs of in-transit migrants and asylum seekers in Mexico. So let's set the stage. Who is this population? What makes them unique? Why are they of interest uh, for the research that you did? Thank you, Alan. And before I, before I start answering that question, I would like to acknowledge that uh, many of the ideas we are going to share today uh, come from a group that has been working in migrant health in Mexico for uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, we, there's four of us uh, who were co-authors of this paper. So I want to recognize the, the work of my colleagues Isabel Vietes and Silvana Larrea from the Population Council of Mexico. And now going to your question, the article uh, we wrote focuses on persons on the move through Mexico, whose main purpose is to reach the United States. So it's important to acknowledge that even though they can be classified as either, either economic migrants or asylum seekers, that's, a, that's an important difference in administrative terms. The persons, the, the actual persons living the experience of going through Mexico aiming for the United States are uh, a combination of people who has uh, very similar needs, even if they uh, decide not to apply for asylum, many of them require international protection and they have uh, other, other needs that, that are similar. And while traditionally uh, migrants in transit through Mexico were mainly of Central American origin, and that's still the case in terms of numbers, in the past few years, people from other regions have also been part of this group. And so we have more and more persons coming from the Caribbean, from Haiti and Cuba, from South America, uh, places like uh, countries like Venezuela or Brazil, and even from Africa and Asia, we have now uh, persons coming from Ghana or Nigeria, so it's a more diverse population than, than used to be the case. The other important thing about this group of persons is that they are on the move, but at the same time, they have been frozen in motion because of the pandemic and because of the migration policies of the, both in the United States and Mexico and Central American countries even. So they are having to stay in, in crowded places all over the Mexico-US border for longer periods of time than used to be the case. And therefore, they are a combination of uh, in-transit persons and persons who are beginning to stay or uh, for for long periods, and therefore they have needs to uh, of integration and inclusion in the in the Mexican society. Also, there are persons that are being held in detention centers, which in Mexico are called estaciones migratorias, by the National Institute of Migration in Mexico. Estaciones migratorias are uh, the the places where the institute. Uh, um, puts persons or uh, detains persons while they are seeing their, their migration status sort out. 
And even if uh, by April of the last year, in response to the pandemic, there was a ruling that people shouldn't be uh, staying in, this, in these places, especially vulnerable persons, because of fear of, of transmission of COVID, of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, in many cases, the, the migration stations remained open. So there's people also that is uh, detained there. And we, we really need in Mexico to have alternatives to detention that are non-custodial and allow people to, to stay in Mexico in, in better conditions. And finally, where is this population a population of interest? Well, from a public health perspective, which is the perspective I work from, they are vulnerable in terms of the risk of infection, first of all, and that's because of their living circumstances. So policies that could change their living circumstances might impact this vulnerability. But I think more importantly, we, we should take a human rights perspective, which Mexico has adopted in its health policies, at least in paper. So these are persons who have a right to health and that right to health needs to be granted. So it is important to understand which barriers they are facing to enjoy the right to health. Well, that's a very uh, helpful uh, way to set the stage. And just to put a, a footnote on it, um, you mentioned that there are different categories of people, whether they're economic refugees or may or may not ultimately seek asylum. But there are international protocols and international agreements to provide people with safe passage as they are fleeing unlivable circumstances. And so the human rights perspective that you describe isn't just sort of a an abstract concept. It's actually embodied in a number of of uh, elements of international law that are designed to assure that uh, people can move when they need to. And so I just think we need to keep our, our eyes on this group for, for multiple uh, reasons. Is that seem like a fair place to start the conversation? Yeah, I agree completely. So you look at policies in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you mentioned that uh, these populations were in some sense frozen in place, and in some sense they were held in facilities that uh, were potential places of transmission. Were there, uh, that's a lot, but were there other effects of the pandemic on this group? Well, it, the, the faction of this specific group of migrants and, and or mobile, different mobile groups such as asylum seekers and migrants in transit, it's much more than COVID. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, as you just said, people were stranded in the northern border of Mexico and the States. So people had to stay longer in order to, to cross. It also happened at the same time that migrant shelters and Casas del Migrante uh, closed. And they were not accepting any more migrants because of fear of, of infection of COVID. That two important issues set the circumstances so migrants were not able to access basic issues of care. This closure of, of, of Casas del Migrante shelters also uh, opened the way to um, a series of refugee camps which were run by migrants themselves. So the context and the circumstances were dynamic, were changing and, and, and migrants uh, we're not accessing basic issues for res resolving their basic needs. Also, uh, there's evidence of mental health issues. It's not only that the, the policies didn't take into account COVID, but also integral access to healthcare of, of quality. Well, let's talk about those policies. Uh, in your paper that you published with us, you analyzed policies adopted in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. How did you go about finding them, looking at them, what were you looking for? I think first I need to emphasize that uh, what we were analyzing were uh, the documents of policies, not the actual uh, whole process of policy making or the actual implementation of policies. No, So this was just an analysis of policy documents. And these were policy documents issued by the Mexican government, by different levels of the Mexican government, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We searched uh, uh, on, online in websites of agencies and official publications of the state and federal congresses and municipalities and in Google. And searched documents issued between January and September 2020 that addressed uh, the, the, the contingency or the, or the pandemic. Uh, we looked for uh, documents issued by the federal government and five states and nine municipalities, which are the places in the northern border of Mexico, in the Mexico-U.S. border, 
that are receiving the, the higher number of, of migrants or in, or in transit migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, etc. And the, the way we analyze these policies or these documents were through two theoretical frameworks. One was the MIPEX index of inclusion of migrants in, in policies. The MIPEX index is produced by a consortium of research organizations in, in Europe initially. They have been expanding uh, through the years. And they aim to provide an index of the, of the degree that migrants are considered in, in, health, in policies in general by, by the governments. And they have one area that is devoted to health policy. So we follow it. The, the main dimensions they, they take into account for inclusion in health policies. That will be the, 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 main, the main theme. And we also employed the framework proposed by Filipa Ladowski, a researcher in, in, in Great Britain, who uh, pro proposes a framework for analyzing migrant health policies too. So these two frameworks while they are not normative, they are more analytic frameworks, they provide a sense of what will be important to, to take into account in a policy for migrants to be included. So what we did was a, like, like checking if the policies that we were analyzing, the documents we were analyzing, included this, uh, these areas or these dimensions. So let's just take the top level. Um, you looked at quite a few documents. To what extent do you have evidence that Mexican authorities were seriously considering the needs of these migrants and asylum seekers in their policies? Well, to what extent? It's a difficult question to answer <laughs> if you want a number for the extent. But what we found mainly is that, paradoxically, the, the policies that were issued in this, uh, in this period considered the needs of migrants in transit and asylum seekers probably over the needs of other populations, of other migrant populations in the country, and we might return to this maybe further on. Uh, but still, they were limited in, in various senses. We, we identified specifically six gaps in the policies. The first one is that migrants were mentioned only in a minority of documents, as, as you say at the beginning, Alan. And the entitlements they, they, they should get or achieve, were not made explicit. So while the policy said uh, people should uh, receive health care, for example, it was not explicit which type of health care, to what extent, etc. Even though the Mexican law currently uh, states that every person who is in Mexico, regardless of their nationality or migration status or etc., is entitled to health care, to free health care actually, the way that it's going to be uh, put, in, put in place in practice is not clear, and less of all in, this, in these documents. So we think that that lack of an explanation of how they are going to access this, this entitlement uh, was lacking, is one of the gaps. The other one was that the characteristics of, of migrants, the, the degree of diver diversity between migrants was not considered in the policies. Also, there were no provisions for obtaining data on migrant health other than COVID. These were very narrowly focused on, on COVID, the policies. And they were focused especially on preventing transmission. Even uh, healthcare was not addressed in, in the same degree as, as uh, the prevention of transmission. And finally, and, and very importantly, the way that these policies are going to be put in place were, was not clear where the funding was going to come from, specifically who was responsible for each aspect of the policy wasn't clear in many of the documents. Only one or two of them mentioned these aspects. So we think that these gaps should be addressed in order to, for these policies to be really really useful or really uh, able to achieve their, their aims. Well, I'd like to go a little deeper into some of those gaps and some of the areas that you found in the documents. Uh, we'll do that after we take a short break. What does it mean for health system leaders to pursue a culture of health? To help answer this question, Health Affairs launched Leading to Health, a series supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. With these journalist-written articles, we examine some of the most innovative health systems out there. Health Affairs recently collected these lessons on a new, easy-to-navigate resource page. Visit healthaffairs.org slash leading dash to dash health and stay up to date on the latest reporting and research. And we're back. I'm speaking with Dr. Bajorquez and Dr. Infante about in-transit migrants and asylum seekers in Mexico and how their needs 
were considered in the nation's uh, policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we went to the break, we heard about six gaps in the policies that existed. Um, And I'd like to look a little bit more at those. Before we do that, though, let's focus on the positive for a moment, uh, which is what needs did you see considered effectively in the documents um, before we go a little deeper into the ones that maybe didn't get as much attention as they warranted? Um, Yeah, well, it's important to recognize the positive things. And we think the policies did take into account the accessibility of of services, the cultural differences between related to to migrants, um, ethnic origin, and stuff like that. How to, uh, also an important issue is how do different agencies or sectors should work together, specifically migration and health, and the importance of social organizations such as Casas del Migrante. The bad thing is that even though these issues were covered, the um, aspects were not specifically addressed in the sense of what type of intervention should be done regarding cultural differences, gender differences, sexual differences, what is res- the responsibility uh, to provide care for the national, um, for the Instituto Nacional de Migración, how th- should they work together with the Ministry of Health, how the work should be done between different uh, levels of government, the federal, the state, and the municipal. So there are positive things in the policies and the documents, but we clearly think they should go further into specifying what uh, Yetza just identified as the main gaps of these documents. Now, these documents were adopted in response to the pandemic. Um, You've noted some areas of inclusion of other healthcare needs, and you've noted some absences. Um, I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about those. This is a vulnerable population. It has many needs other than avoiding contracting COVID. So what what did you see that stood out as forward-looking and inclusive with respect to the needs of the population? And what did you see that you felt really should have been there with respect to the healthcare needs of the population? The policies and the documents were really narrow to COVID they didn't take into account the integral aspects of of health. And as we have mentioned just before, mental health is an an aspect that is mentioned, but still not as specified or addressed in its dimension it has right now. And it's not also issues of mental health of migrants or users of these shelters, but also mental health of who is working with them. The mental health issues of the volunteers and the staff of Casas del Migrante should also be an important aspect for uh, policy to respond. We said like the first barrier of response to migration, really, migrants do not access governmental health care as their main way to respond to their needs. They go to the shelters to have access to many other things. They feel safe, that they don't feel stigmatized or discriminated. We think that health needs should be addressed in a more comprehensive way but also take into account the issues that these staff and volunteers and important people of the Casas del Migrante are, take, uh, are facing right now. I, I agree with what you were saying, Cesar, and I think it is important to recognize that this has been an issue for the general population as well and all over the world, that uh, as the health system focused on, on COVID, uh, other healthcare needs were left out. But uh, as you say, Cesar, especially for this population, they have like very specific needs related to their living conditions. So uh, probably things that has to do with the transmission of other infectious diseases, for example, are very important and weren't addressed. Uh, maternal health, child health were also important. Uh, vaccination for, for, for other diseases were also left out of the response. So yeah, I think this was a very narrow response in that sense. Yeah, one of the... Uh areas you mentioned that stood out for me when I read the paper was the failure to recognize the diversity of the migrant population. Yeah, so you said a little bit about the broad range of countries in transit migrants uh, are coming from when they're in Mexico. Why is it important and what would be different if those policies and policy statements had an appropriate recognition of the diversity of that population? 
Yeah, I, I mean, cultural adequacy is very important for, for migrant health in general, because even when access to health services is granted by law, uh, inclusive health policies need to consider the, the special characteristics of, of the diverse groups of migrants. And also that the needs of migrants are likely to be different in many senses to the needs of the non-migrant population. So this includes, on the one hand, these issues of, of cultural adequacy, which, for example, in Mexico is very clear with the issue of language. Uh, we don't really have uh, translators in the health services that can translate, for example, to French or from French. And we are having more and more French-speaking migrants in Mexico, no? or, or even uh, Creole, the, the, the common language that they use in Haiti. We don't have translators from that. And also we have uh, persons coming from even from Central America who don't, do not speak Spanish necessarily. They speak different uh, indigenous languages, and we don't have translators for those languages. So that's a very basic thing to address that is not being taken in, into consideration in the policies. And it was very interesting to see that in a couple of documents that we reviewed, the, the issue of cultural adequacy was mentioned more in relation to persons of Mexican origin, but of, of uh, indigenous Mexican origin. Those were mentioned in, in the documents of a couple of states, but the needs of persons of other origins were not, not uh, even mentioned. And also, there, there is an, another important thing about these specific groups of migrants, which is the, the mobility, the mobile condition in which they, they are residing or, or, or living. So the fact that you need to provide care for, a, for persons who are uh, moving from city to city, from town to town. So how you follow up, how you provide continuity of care, for example, even if, if healthcare access is granted by law, people don't have the information about that. They don't know about their rights. They don't know about how to access the system, which is quite complicated because it doesn't work. Well, I, I think that happens always, but it doesn't work as it's supposed to work in paper. So there are a lot of, of things you need to know if you really want to access the system. Uh, one uh, uh, Typical issue is that for primary care centers, you need to go very early in the morning, like 6 a.m., and stay in line if you want to be seen by a doctor. And if you don't know that and you come in at, I don't know, at noon and try to get a, to, to see a doctor, you are not going to be able to, to see the doctor. And you are going to feel that you were discriminated against. And maybe, may, maybe it's not a matter of discrimination. It's just a matter of not knowing that you needed to be there at 6 a.m., so these are very simple things, small things that become real huge barriers for, for migrants. Well, as we bring this conversation to a close, I, I want to focus on a comment in the paper where you say that one factor in your findings might be Mexico's migration tradition. It seems very relevant in these matters to think about how the patterns of migration have changed, the composition of this group, the size of this group, the circumstances, so much has changed in the last half a dozen years. And I just wonder if you could, again, put some of these findings in context. When you said migration tradition, what did that mean? And how are the changes that have occurred in recent years with respect to migration relevant to the findings of your paper? Yeah, by migration tradition, we mean the, the patterns of migration uh, in a country, you know, within a country, from a country to a country, but the patterns and flows of migration and how those patterns influence the way decision makers in the, in the country think about migration, so how the policies are, are put in place or developed in the, in the country. So while migrants have been transiting or passing through Mexico for, for decades, then the numbers of migrants have increased in the past, in the past decades, maybe, going up to the hundreds of thousands in, uh, per year. And there's also been a, a, a phenomenon of, a, of the changing characteristics of, of these migrants and also of the way they, they travel to, to the country. So there were two phenomena that were relevant or, or got a lot of attention, of public attention, which was first the arrival of Haitians in 2016, and then the migrant caravans, so-called migrant caravans, which were groups of migrants uh, traveling together, big groups, like thousands of migrants traveling together, trying to, to get across Mexico, which started in 2018, 2019. So these two phenomena, uh, call a lot of attention, and we believe that's that's why the policies in this period 
focus on the, on, on this type of migrants and uh, to the to the detriment of of others. No, actually, in Mexico, the the main migration phenomenon in terms of volume, if we are, are speaking only of numbers, it's the mov- the movement of Mexicans between Mexico and the United States. But the immigration from Mexico and return migration from the United States, and uh, at at its peaks in 2007, we had almost 800,000 persons moving uh, across the border from, from Mexico to the, the United States. So uh, even if that went down uh, steeply after 2008 uh, because of the economic crisis and migration policies, still we're talking about thousands, hundreds of, of thousands of persons of Mexican origin or Mexicans going to the States, coming back from the States. Uh, On the other hand, in Mexico, according to the last census, less than 1% of the population uh, are immigrants or people living in Mexico who were born in other country, in in another country. And most of them have been born in the United States. So again, in terms of numbers, the main migration phenomenon in Mexico is it's indeed the, the migration of Mexicans to the United States. And formerly in the past administration, this was the population, the migrant population that was addressed in health policies almost to the exclusion of, of other populations. And then we had this dramatic change in the policies when Mexicans who go or come from the United States were like uh, displaced in the focus of, po- of public policy. Uh, when, when this public policy focused on this group of intransit migrants, where Central Americans were the more visible group and maybe Haitians, but other groups were not taking into account. So we, we believe that uh, because of these changes in the, in the migration flows, the policies are reflecting that and are, again, leaving out some populations, making some populations invisible. And that's, a, that's an important gap also of the, of the policies. Well, uh, it's been a terrific uh, opportunity for me to learn from you and your work, uh, not just the specific findings uh, in the paper that we published, but to have a broader understanding of the changing dynamics and the need for very specific response to a highly vulnerable, but also quite diverse uh, population. I'm appreciative of the work you've done and that you'll continue to do, I am sure, and for being with me today on Health Policy. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about a health policy. Health Policy is produced by Health Affairs, the leading journal for health policy research. The team behind the show includes Patty Sweet, Jeff Byers, Julia Vivolo, Sarah Kolk, and Sue Ducat. Like the show? Subscribe to A Health Podacy on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thanks for listening, and have a great morning, day, or evening.